to call your attention this morning to one verse of Scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 2. This will pick up where I stopped reading last Sunday. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, or sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Context of this verse deals with suffering for the gospel. Paul has identified himself in this setting as a prisoner, literally, in a Roman dungeon in Rome, which will end in his death, probably not too long after he wrote this letter. He has encouraged Timothy to guard the trust of the gospel committed to him, and if necessary, to do so at the expense of personal comfort and at the requirement of suffering. It is not that Paul enjoys suffering. Anyone who enjoys suffering for the sake of suffering is sick. You know, there's something wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't suffer just because we enjoy feeling pain and discomfort. Paul saw a greater good than the downside of his personal suffering and discomfort, and he was willing to indulge and endure the suffering that he faced for the sake of the gospel. In this case, he was willing to face and experience death, according to history, by having his head chopped off for the sake of the gospel that he preached. Whatever we do with this verse, we must interpret it in the light of the greater context of suffering for the betterment of the gospel and of God's people in hearing the gospel. Does human suffering redeem people from sin, our personal suffering? If we make human suffering instrumental in any way in a person's redemption, in salvation, then we, we must deal with the obvious conflict, literally contradiction, that appears between that idea and the scriptural teaching that it is exclusively the sufferings of Christ the God incarnate man that atoned for and redeemed us from sin. Take a note, keep your finger here, and go back to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. <clears throat> There's an interesting verse that, that deals with this. <clears throat> this is part of, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the longest, in terms of the English punctuation, the longest sentence in the Bible. I will not read the whole sentence. I'll just read the verse. Verse 24 of Colossians chapter 1. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. <clears throat> How do you fill up that which is behind in the sufferings of Christ? Is there something deficient? about his suffering? Obviously, that's not Paul's intent. I rather suggest that that passage and what we're looking at today in 2 Timothy identifies the fact that Christ's sufferings and our sufferings are for two different objectives. They fill two roles. They serve two purposes that are complementary but not the same. I'll suggest that one occurred for our eternal salvation. The other occurs for our growth in faith and our discipleship in the gospel. Our present salvation, if I use that term. Human suffering by a godly man, human suffering even by an apostle, does not redeem people from their sins. Only the sufferings of Christ, who is God in human flesh, is competent to redeem other men from sin. Dr. Tom Constable is a very respected and long-standing member of the teaching staff of Dallas Theological Seminary. Not exactly a blue blood primitive Baptist. And so I want to read something that I think I found interesting, I think you will, from Tom Constable's pen. In describing and, and commenting on this passage, he identifies that the term elect as used in the New Testament, when it applies, 
the children of God. There are times when the word applies to a body of people. There are times when it applies to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. When it applies to individual children of God, refers to regenerate children of God, not people who are yet unregenerate, but part of the elect family of God. So that's the lead-in to the quotation uh, from Constable. There is good reason to understand the term in this context as a virtual synonym for a regenerate saint. First of all, in every usage of the term applied to men in the New Testament, it always refers to a justified saint. I use the term regenerate elect or regenerate saint. Conversely, it never refers to someone who was elect in the eternity past, but who has not yet entered into the purpose of their election, justification. It is best to be under, it is best to understand by the elect, Timothy, and the faithful men of verse 2. And that's in this context. The men who will be taught by Timothy the things Timothy learned from Paul. Timothy is being exhorted to suffer in his ministry to the faithful men just as Paul has been in prison for his ministry to the elect. The idea of Paul's suffering for the sanctification and growth of the churches is a common New Testament theme and is easily seen in this passage as well. I mentioned it and read it from Colossians chapter 1. I love this closing quote from Constable. I want you to listen very carefully. This is a person on staff at Dallas Theological Seminary, not a primitive Baptist preacher. Hear it carefully. And, and I'll note, he puts an exclamation point behind this sentence. Here then are saved people in need of salvation. Aha! <laughs> the salvation in view is necessarily sanctification, or perhaps more precisely, victorious perseverance through trials. I, I, I had not thought about the term elect applying to regenerate elect before I read Constable's citation. I tend to be favorable to that idea. I can't think of a passage that, that actually uses the term when you look at it precisely in any other way. Um, it certainly doesn't create any theological baggage that we have to deal with at all. So, uh, I think when I start looking back over the passages that I can immediately recall, uh, his application holds. We can describe, without doing violence to Scripture, of course, people whom God has elected but has not yet regenerated. And the purposes of God for eternity involve every one of his elect, whether regenerate at this point or not. But when you look at Scripture, Ephesians 1, for example, or other passages, the references to people who are both elect and have been born again or regenerated. But I love Constable's point, uh, and I think it sets the stage for what I want to teach from this passage this morning. We have saved people who shall experience eternal glory in need of salvation. Let's kind of break it down and look at it and, and then pull the pieces together if we can for the will of God. Therefore, I endure all things for them. There's a specific objective. He wants to benefit, borrow Constable's definition, regenerate elect people. Immediately, this takes the function of the gospel out of the questionable and disputable discussion that we sometimes have with our theological friends about what the purpose of the gospel really is. Does God use the gospel as an instrument in the new birth? Does God use the gospel to help facilitate or apply the blood of Christ to regenerate not yet, or, or elect not yet regenerated elect? Or does God use the gospel to instruct regenerate elect and to save people who are already saved? Save in one sense people who are already saved in another sense. Uh, if someone raises the question to you that this is a new idea, that primitive Baptists have come up with, remind them that Samuel Richardson, the old English Baptist who helped write, according to most uh, indications, the first London Confession of 1644, slightly revised and refined in 1646, 
He was a member of those seven churches that later embraced and adopted the 1689 Confession. He died, apparently, before 1689. He wrote a, an extended thesis. I have a copy of it. I shared it with some of you, identifying that according to his belief and the teaching of Scripture, faith, manifest, active faith on our part, is an evidence of, not an instrument in, our salvation. William Kippen, who signed the 1689 Confession, wrote a powerful and precise introduction to Richardson's thesis, saying, Amen, I agree with this, and I'll stand up and take the heat if people don't agree. I would suggest that all of the people who signed and framed the London 1689 Confession probably did not agree on this point. There was evidence in Richardson's writing that he had been somewhat ostracized for his view. It's not a universal view today. But I'll say, when I read Scripture, and when I study the harmony of Scripture and the doctrines of the grace of God, I believe that this is a truth that needs to be preached. To accomplish something that Paul felt was caused by his preaching, Paul was willing to endure suffering. So it was important to Paul. It was not something he viewed as inconsequential or coincidental. He uses the term. He introduces this term here. He uses it repeatedly in his writings. For the elect's sakes. Interestingly, I had not noticed the plural form of the word sake until I was reading it just a moment ago. There are those today who teach that election is class election. Isaiah 42.1 refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delights. A pantograph, Bible answer man, is a champion of this viewpoint. I don't agree with him. I think he... He's trying to evade the point rather than affirm the point of election in Scripture. But his viewpoint, and, and, and he's joined by many, is that God elected Christ. That's primarily biblical election. And if you take the necessary steps to put yourself in Christ, then you're identified as one of God's elect because you got yourself in Christ. <laughs> oh, that's not the point. It is not the elect's sake, and because you're in Christ, you happen to be identified as an elect. It is individual, plural people who are the elect, and their sakes is involved here. Everywhere the word election, as applied to children of God, is used in the New Testament, it, it refers to individuals, not to a generic class of human beings. And for that reason, I would reject this idea as being a valid explanation of New Testament and biblical election. There are others who will say, yes, the Bible does teach election, but all it's referring to is that God, because he's omniscient, he's timeless, he can look down through time, see and know the people who would make the right decision, who would believe, who would have faith, who would accept the proposition of the gospel and live good lives. And so God, knowing in advance their conduct, their faith, God elected them. We just read a few weeks ago, right in this same chapter, that our salvation is not according to our works, foreseen or otherwise. Uh, I want to give you two quotes. One of them is kind of mixed. It's a bittersweet quote, but I want to give them both of them to you. For, and again, uh, the first one is from the Bible, uh, a Believer's Bible Commentary. Two men co collaborated named MacDonald and Farstad in, in this commentary. This, this particular commentary is published by Nelson Publications. So it's not an off-the-wall, uh, backroom kind of, kind of work. Quote, quoting from this passage, While the Bible does teach that God chooses people to be saved, it nowhere says that he selects some to be damned. Double election. R.C. Sproul, as much as I respect R.C. Sproul, openly teaches double election. I, don't, I, I like Sproul, but I don't like that part of his teaching. Don't believe it. Those who are saved are saved by the sovereign grace of God. Those who are lost are lost by their own deliberate choice, and I would add, by their own deliberate sin. 
No one should quarrel with God over the doctrine of election. Now, this is not a primitive beggar. That's why I love this. No one should quarrel with God over the doctrine of election. The doctrine simply allows God to be God. The sovereign of the universe who deals in grace, justice, righteousness, and love. He never does anything unfair or unkind. But notice the last part of this quote. But he often shows favor that is completely unmerited. The first objection you'll hear from many people to the doctrine of election when you introduce the idea is it makes God partial. It makes God show favor. And, and, and they'll quote one little part of a verse of Scripture, but they won't quote nor refer to the whole passage from Acts chapter 10. God is no respecter of persons. Therefore, you can't believe in election because it makes God a respecter of persons. They ignore the context. Go to Acts chapter 10 and Peter's acknowledgement that God has now extended his saving grace to Gentiles, the house of Cornelius, and let's read the whole verse of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Then Peter explains his own use of that term. But in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is, not in the process of becoming, not shall become, is accepted with him. When someone manifests faith, Cornelius manifested faith in the very beginning of Acts chapter 10 before Peter went down there and preached to him. He worked righteousness at the very beginning of Acts chapter 10 before Peter went down there and preached to him. Peter says, if a man exercises faith and works righteousness, he is accepted with God. <laughs> I'll just say, Peter, amen. You and I are on the same page here. I agree, don't you? God does show favor. If he didn't, he wouldn't elect. But his favor is never based on merit. It is always unmerited favor. Isn't that what the word grace means? Unmerited favor? I mean, you're just dealing with the basic definition of the word grace. If you say God can't show unmerited favor to anyone, you've just said God can't be gracious. He can't show grace. Huh? You better hope he does. <laughs> For your sake and mine and everyone else's that will be in heaven. Because without that, we're in trouble. Now, Matthew Henry, a, a name that many of you are familiar with, uh, a respected and very old Reformed commentary, uh, is bittersweet. He's bittersweet about a lot of things. I, I would never put Matthew Henry down, but I certainly would not at every time agree with him. For that matter, I don't always agree with John Gill. And for that matter, I don't always agree with myself. Okay, so this is Henry on, uh, so I'm putting Henry and Gill and me in good company. We don't always agree with each other. <laughs> uh, Elder John Henry Thor at one time was preaching, and, and he could tell that some of the folks in the congregation didn't fully agree with what he was saying, and he just kind of paused a moment and, and, and made an observation. He said, you just remember, exactly where you disagree with me is exactly where I disagree with you. <laughs> and sometimes I have to have that conversation with myself. Okay, this is Matthew Henry. Now, you'll understand, knowing where I come from and what I teach, you'll understand the bittersweet of this quote. But I want you to, I want you to hear something from it that, that contributes to today's lesson. Next to the salvation of our own souls, we should be willing to do and suffer anything to promote the salvation of the souls of others. He, he, he actually does believe that, that the gospel is instrumental, not causative, but instrumental in the salvation of folks. And there's where he and I would disagree. The elect are designed to obtain salvation. He quotes from First Timothy or First Thessalonians chapter five. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. This salvation is in Christ Jesus. In Him is the fountain, the purchaser, and the giver of it. And it is accomplished with eternal, or accompanied with eternal glory. There is no salvation in Christ Jesus without it. The sufferings of our apostle were for the elect's sake, comma, for their confirmation and encouragement. There's why I wanted you to hear the quote. I suffer all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I want to start by observing verb tense. This is, this is a little technical, but I hope it will clear up some issues for you as you study this verse and the greater teaching of Paul. There is a salvation that is presently in Christ. 
There is a salvation in Christ that will come in the future with eternal glory. We don't have the eternal glory of our salvation today. Paul writes in other places about the glory which shall be revealed in us, something coming in the future. There's a salvation in Christ Jesus today. There's a salvation for you and me that is in Christ Jesus today as we face the challenges and difficulties of life, as we face our own whole cold and sometimes callous hearts of unbelief and doubting. There's a salvation that is in Christ Jesus as I evaluate and assess my choices for what I'm going to do to this afternoon, tomorrow, next week, next year. If I, if I incorporate the Lord Jesus Christ and his word in my decision-making process, I'm going to enjoy something that I have available to me in Christ right now. That doesn't cause or enrich my eternal salvation. It's something I have right now. I shall also enjoy that glory which shall be revealed. After I die, and especially after the resurrection. Paul's talking about both. Something that's present, something that's future. Uh, let me give you a, a, a very simple parallel. On July 3rd, Sandra and I packed up our fifth wheel and drove down to San Diego to spend a week of relaxation and rest. We had various things planned, and we were just, you know, get away, let your hair down, relax. Uh, uh, you know, these crazy cell phones, you just don't quite get away from the phone ever. But, uh, you know, it's a different pace, it's a different setting. Relax and rest and, and, and recuperate from the daily demands of life. Our daughter Natalie and our three-month-old granddaughter Gabriella also drove down and spent the week with us. I want you to see something. Whether Natalie and Gabriella came down or not, we were there. We went. We had planned to go. And whether they came or not, we were there. We were going to be there. We were going to spend our week. Now, I acknowledge that their presence changed our agenda. <laughs> You don't do the same thing with a three-month-old. You do without a three-month-old. But as a grandparent, I have to say it was great. <laughs> you see that their coming didn't make us go or not go. It didn't alter the fact that we were going, that we were there. But it modified our agenda, and it enriched our time there because they were with us there. Look at the language Paul uses here. I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may, four-letter word, I've said for years, it's those simple words that trip us in our biblical interpretation. Not those, you know, Sandra teases me sometimes for using theological, technical terms. And I need to be careful about that. I'll, I'll read people who, who, who write whole theses about the, the, the difference between infralapsarianism and supralapsarianism and and, and most people, when they start trying to distinguish between the two, get a lapse of memory and, mem and mental processes. Well, uh, in simple terms, superlapsarianism is the R.C. Sproul. He identifies himself as superlapsarian that says God causes everything and God orders everything to bring good out of it in the end. That's superlapsarianism. Infralapsarianism says, no, God doesn't cause sin. God doesn't cause everything causatively. I mean, there's more to it, but that's kind of a thumbnail, bottom line distinction between the two. Well, why don't you just say that instead of saying infralapsarianism and superlapsarianism? Hey, okay. <clears throat> you know, point made and accepted. But in Scripture, common, ordinary language of, of, of people who spoke Greek and lived on the street or walked the streets of, of first century Rome and Greek, Grecian culture. Simple words common language of the street, of, of the ordinary person, not of the Greek poets and the Greek philosophers and the lawyers and, and, and statesmen. And this is a simple four-letter English word, also. What does also mean? Natalie and Gabriella also came to San Diego. In addition to us, they came. They stayed with us. W-I-T-H. Hmm. Another four-letter word. Two four-letter words make the point, and the only point I really want you to see, 
that clarifies and answers the questions of this, this passage. There is a salvation in Christ Jesus today for the obedient and faithful child of God that is also with the eternal glory that was purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ in his sufferings. I don't know why people have such a big problem with that concept. It seems to appear on every page of Scripture. I don't know to this day what the man's names were. He grew up in Virginia. Early in his ministry, moved to the deep south Alabama, Dothan, Alabama. Lois, you'll know where it is. Probably a few other people here will even know where it is. But it's about as far south and east as you can get in the state of Alabama. Trip south of Dothan and you're in Florida. Trip east of Dothan and you're in Georgia. I visited him one time and, 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 and I enjoyed the man's fellowship. He was a good thinker and a good preacher. But he had grown up in an area where where there was a group of people who were the name Primitive Baptists who believed in literally in the absolute, and I'll quote, causative predestination of all things. It goes back about a hundred years ago, or a little longer, and a fellow named Gilbert Beebe introduced this idea among Primitive Baptists in his time, and it created quite a rancor among Primitive Baptists around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. They literally took God's sovereignty to excess and, and openly proclaimed and asserted that God causes everything, even sin. From divorce to the Holocaust, everything in human experience is causatively ordained by God. Now, there's, first of all, a biblical problem with this concept. Repeatedly, Jeremiah the prophet raises the practice among uh, his people in the Old Testament, Judah, the southern kingdom, of Baal worship and child sacrifice. And he says they have, they have burned their children in the fire, they have worshipped Baal, which I commanded them not, neither entered it into my mind at any time. Will you tell me how God can ordain and cause something that never entered his mind? Did God know about it? Of course he did. Did he cause it? That's the language. No. While I was in San Diego, I read a delightful book by Chuck Swindoll on the mystery of God's will. Swindoll cites from John chapter 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. And he makes the point, and I don't always agree with Swindoll's theology, but his research on text and, and, and passages and language in the New Testament is typically very well done. He makes the point that the grammatical structure in the Greek New Testament text says, Let no man say when he is tempted, even indirectly, I am tempted of God. If God causes something to happen, and that happening entices you to sin, God indirectly causes you to sin. You understand what I'm saying? And James says, you can't say that. Don't blame your sin on God. Well, that's not the only passage yet. I'll give you two more. First Corinthians chapter 14, Paul has dealt for three chapters now with the, with the question of spiritual gifts, a, a, a teaching that really needs to be taught in, the, in some Christian circles today because of the excesses to which spiritual gifts are claimed and, and interpreted. There are folks who, who, who trumpet confusion, you know, dancing up and down the aisles, crawling up and down the aisles like a snake laughing hilariously and saying, the Holy Spirit caused me to do it. That's, my, that's the gift of holy laughter. That's the gift of tongues. That's the gift of whatever crawling like a snake on the church aisle is, amounts to and blaming it on the Holy Spirit. But Paul says this, God is not the author of confusion. God is not the cause of confusion. We, there's confusion in the world, there, there's confusion in churches, there's confusion in marriages and families, there's confusion at work sites. When you see confusion in the world, rest assured, God didn't cause it. And finally, John, in his first epistle, says, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, is not of, as a source or cause, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
I mean, you could go on forever with this, this theme of Scripture, but three Scriptures speak loudly. God doesn't cause everything. Given the sovereignty of God, it, it's an obvious point that need not even be argued, that God permits things that he does not cause or it wouldn't occur. To permit and to cause are not the same thing. God doesn't cause evil. God doesn't cause sin. Never does. And you can't blame your sin on God. Flip Wilson, the serpent in the garden. If you don't know who Flip Wilson is, don't worry. I'm an old curmudgeon. And Adam, all are experts in saying it's someone else's fault. The devil made me do it. God, this woman you gave me is the one responsible for my sin. And ever since then, men have been blaming their wives when they mess up. <laughs> Sorry, fellas. You mess up, you got one person to blame, the guy you look at in the mirror in the morning, right? God didn't cause it. Now, it's interesting. In this discussion, this difference of theology that occurred among our people in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, those folks who embrace the idea that God absolutely orchestrates, I mean, this is total fatalism. If you, if you, want, if you, know, you want me to avoid the, the, the long technical theological terms, it's total absolute fatalism. God causes everything that happens. So you can't blame yourself. You can't blame somebody else. You just say, I'm just doing what God ordained me to do and I can't help it. Ugh. Number one, it violates Scripture. Number two, it violates the essential character of God. It makes God diabolical and schizophrenic. You know, split personality. He's altogether good, but he's altogether diabolical by ordaining sin for some secret reason that we don't know about. It violates the character of God. It makes him diabolical. Now, it's interesting. Our folks who didn't agree with this teaching introduced a concept, a term that we use to this day. We've shorthanded it as we do most things in language. Conditional time salvation. Conditional time salvation. You know, those folks believe in time salvation, but it's unconditional. God ordains it. God predestinated it. It's not conditional. Well, we've shortened the term to time salvation. The salvation that it is presently in Christ. What, he's talk, what we're talking about. Elder Dallas, this fellow, S.J.B. Dallas. I never did know what the three letters mean, but he always went for the term. Elder S.J.B. Dallas. I'd like to know what his wife called him, but I never figured it out, so I never didn't learn what his, word, what his name really was, but he went by the initials. He grew up in an area where a lot of these folks uh, still survive. The doctrine itself will pretty much eliminate itself because pretty soon people who hold to that will do nothing, do nothing, because God didn't ordain it, and pretty soon they'll just die. They don't exist anymore. There's not a lot of those folks around anymore because of that. Anyway, he grew up in an area where there was a lot of that, and so he was, he was sensitive to the fact that if he used these terms that, that, that talk about active discipleship, conditional time salvation, people would be critical. So he was always trying to find a way to avoid the criticism. One day he quoted from 1 Peter chapter 3. You, you read the verse last week. The like figure, whereunto baptism, doth, he, doth also even now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the place, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And they just blurted it out. Well, you don't like time salvation. What about now salvation? That's scriptural. <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 and here's the point. That term was introduced to counter an error. And actually probably was objected to and introduced by the other side to go against a truth that was taught without the term. Active discipleship appears on every page of Scripture and just about every page of church history. It's a given. It's believed. It's taught. It's, it's, it's everyday truth. Acts 2.38. Repent. Don't say, well, you, you know, I'm preaching it, and if, if you repent, it's because God ordained it. No, it's an active command. Do you repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Every positive command in Scripture assumes obedience and a willing choice to obey, not an absolute programmed consequence of divine ordination. <clears throat> Sometimes history repeats itself, sadly. If we don't learn the lesson, it shall be repeated. I endure all things for the elect's sake, Paul says, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Eternal glory has been assured. It has been earned by the death of Christ. But there's something else, Paul says. I'm willing to suffer so that the elect will, in, will obtain that. Oh, by the way, the word obtain, the verb, and the tense and, and, and mood and voice of New Testament Greek words, it's not a passive voice. It's an it's a active voice. That means you do something. You don't sit around and wait for something to be done to you. It's the subjective mood, which means Paul is couching what he's teaching in the form of an admonition or an exhortation, saying, I expect you to do this. If you were automatically programmed to do it, why would Paul even say, I expect you to do it? He would give you a direction. He just say, it's going to happen. So, oh, I mean, it'll happen. God's ordaining it. And that's, it, it I'm trying to show you that, that not only is this teaching unscriptural, when you get down to the practical level, it's downright silly. It just doesn't fit reality. You know, for me to think or to teach that every child of God shall hear the gospel, shall believe it, shall embrace it, shall persevere in faith and holiness, is kind of like a parent thinking without any effort any instruction or any leadership that every child in his family shall always and under all circumstances be the perfect child. Hello. Any of you parents want to say that's the way it works in real life? Huh? I see some parents are smiling. You got it. Some children are naturally compliant and responsive. Other children want to test the envelope. God bless them. They're your child. You love them. Your love isn't conditioned on what they do. They're your child and you love them. But their disposition is not the same. And their obedience is not the same. That's just the way real life is. In the absolute, if, if Christian obedience were automatically ordained, where is the basis, the logical basis, for something that is clear in Scripture, divine chastening. Hmm? And if you want to make that divinely ordained, you're making God even more diabolical. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit any way you slice it. What Paul's saying? There's something that is important. It's something that, that is worth me suffering for. It's worth me dying for. It doesn't give you eternal glory. It doesn't contribute to your gaining eternal glory. But it is instrumental in your finding something right now that enriches your life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we close it, I, you know, I, I used to hear people, I don't hear that very much, and I'm frankly thankful I don't. I think it's a, it's a, it's a dreadful, extreme, even if it's stated hypothetically, and that should never be. I've heard people say, you can burn all the Bibles, close down all the churches, shut down all the pulpits, and heaven will still be populated. You know, I believe it, but that's not the teaching of Scripture. Scripture teaches that there is a salvation now in Christ that is important. It's important enough, Paul said, I'll die for it. So the elect can find the joy of that salvation in Christ right now. Is it unique to Paul or to the New Testament? Of course not. I know I'm saying to the choir, but sometimes the choir needs to hear the song. King David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, a man described in the New Testament and in five scripture as the man after God's own heart. Oh, that doesn't mean his heart was always just right with God. It wasn't right up on the rooftop looking over at the next rooftop. But when God convicted his heart, 
He never tried to rationalize and excuse his sin. Instantly, when God said, you sinned, he said, thank you, God, I repent. And he did. And that way, he was a man after God's own heart. Would God appoint a man who was not saved to compile and write most of the hymns of the Old Testament worship, the Psalms of David? Hardly think so. He's a saved man. He sins. Psalm 32, I believe, is a graphic depiction of David's private convictions between the time of the sin with Bathsheba and the time Nathan the prophet comes to him in Psalm 50 and says, you're the man. In Psalm 51, his immediate response when Nathan says, you're the man, is a prayer to God for forgiveness. Hear the words of this prayer carefully. Restore unto me what? The joy of thy salvation. He didn't pray for lost salvation to be restored. He didn't lose his salvation. But he lost the joy of it. And Psalm 32 graphically describes sleepless nights, pillow wet with tears of grief over his sin and the conviction of conscience that made him feel like his bones were drying up like a desert wind blowing through them. Agonizing self-condemnation. But the minute he repents, acknowledges his sin, and confesses to God, God restored the joy of his salvation. And Psalm 32 tells you about that too. Same thing we're teaching here. Same thing Paul has in mind in this verse. Salvation, eternal glory that shall be revealed in us at resurrection is secured by the sufferings of Christ. There is a salvation now that is in Christ. It's not in you and me and how good we are and how, how perfectly we perform. It is still a salvation in Christ Jesus. But that's why we preach and endure hardship and suffer even to the point of death. So that the elect of God, regenerate elect, who have the promise of God that that glory shall be revealed in them, shall also with that eternal glory enjoy the present blessings of faithfulness in Christ while they live. Is it important? Of course it is. Should we emphasize it? God forbid that we not. Shall we keep it distinct? God help us to do so.